welcome to the stage former Imagineer and Senior Creative Director at Universal Creative, Jason Sorrell. I'm going to want that to play any time I enter a room now. That's the danger of these things. Uh, it, now I know what a full house looks like. This is amazing. Thank you. Where, where were you people earlier today? Our special presenter today needs no introduction, but I was given a live mic and I need to I mean to use it. He is an artist, he is a storyteller, he is an Imagineer, he is a Disney legend, and it is my honor and privilege to call him mentor and friend. Always two there are, a master and an apprentice, and you are about to meet one of the masters. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Baxter. <laughs> times together back in the olden days. Absolutely. Yeah, they're getting older by, by the second. I've got so many slides today that I don't know whether we can get through this. So We will get through it. We're probably going to run over a little bit. Yeah. But that's he, okay. And the audience has given you permission. And he makes so much fun along the way. Uh, I, I, I have encouraged him to uh, kibitz me. And it's very respectful. So respectful fun. Should be a lot of fun. So we're going to take a magical journey here today. For me, I was here on this property 50 years ago uh, for the last nine months of construction as a 22-year-old kid, wondering what the heck they had sent me down here for. Uh, but I'm going to take you back further than that. So we're going to go back to my childhood. I grew up with Disneyland. And of course, the symbol of Disneyland was this castle, and I had to have one. So I built one about this big that I still have when I was 16. And we entered it in the Orange County Fair in California, and I got, my mom got me a blue ribbon, and uh, that was the start. And so when Mary Poppins came along, I was so enthralled with that. My parents wanted me to be an architect, but I didn't know what an Imagineer was or anything. So I just started doing this idea for a Mary Poppins attraction, because I loved Disneyland. And uh, this is a look at what was inside that building. Now remember, I was a kid, probably about 19, and uh, I worked at Disneyland scooping ice cream, so I knew kind of the ins and outs. And uh, so, you know, exploring the dark rides and everything, I kind of put together my best thinking of a ride that would start on a carousel, and then your horses would leap off and go into the jolly holiday portion. And it was interesting enough to Imagineering for them to not hire me, but they said, why don't you go to school in art and study art, and come back in a couple years. And uh, that wasn't what I expected to hear. I wanted them to say, oh my God, you're fantastic. But I did that, and I, um, this was the exterior of that ride at night. You can see the carousels, and, the, uh, and then you got to a certain point, and the carousel horses jumped off and went into the dark ride. It still would be a good ride. I'm really hopeful that they will go back and put the one on in Epcot. I think that would be a home run. Um, I did not go, it went jumping. Okay, so uh, in addition to my art thing, I love the idea of engineering, even though I never studied it and I don't have any kinds of degrees in that. And ultimately, when I went to Imagineering, it was a combination of my art and this wacky thing where marbles ran through this thing for about 15 minutes uh, that I brought in uh, with my portfolio. And they said, well, we get an okay artist, but we also get this guy that loves to play with engineering. So I got the job. And then when you're a lowly model builder, you start thinking about like, why did they do certain things? And I went, why did they put that? And you had a lot of experience with dinosaurs at Universal, I know. But I was really bugged that in California, our dinosaurs are on the park railroad train near the end of the ride. You go through the Grand Canyon. Ours chase people and eat them. That's, that's, I think that's, that's better. <laughs> But ours are there while you're riding on the, the passenger trains around the park. And I thought, wouldn't they be better at the end of the Jungle Cruise where the boats go through a lost world and everything? So I didn't realize I was probably making half the designers at Imagineering really mad that I was challenging their, uh, 
their achievements. But those stories are, are legendary, because even when I started, people would talk about, oh, you know, when, when, when Tony started, he had, he had this whole Mary Poppins ride, he had this thing with a marble, and, you know, it's like, I, I approached Marty Sklar at a press event and bothered him, but, you know, yeah, there it is. something. It so worked. But my magnum opus in school was to do a ride, sort of loosely, Pirates of the Caribbean had just opened, and it was the greatest thing. It still is the greatest thing. Especially the California one is better than the one here in Florida. We have something better. Okay. Um, he's retiring. He can say what he wants, and he's going to. Yeah, we, you have everything else, but we have the best pirate ride. Anyway, so I made a Viking version uh, that was to parallel a film that I'd seen in the annual report called The Island at the Top of the World. And I didn't know anything about the movie because the pictures in the annual report were about that big. And I'm kind of glad I didn't because I think mine was better than the movie. <laughs> but you went to a lost world at the top of the planet and found, among all these other things, a jewel bedecked cave with a, a dragon. And that dragon that you're looking at right now is really important because always hold on to your dreams. And when we get later in the show, I'll, I'll talk more about dragons. Anyway, from that, they hired me. And so this is down here in Florida. As I said, I was here 50 years ago, and I was assigned to 20,000 leagues under the sea. And uh, we had to take those green plastic boats and look up, make them look like they were rusty old Nautiluses with all the brown aging and stuff. And fortunately, I had gone to school in theater design, so I knew how to prepare surfaces and make them look ready and whatnot. So even though the guys that I was working with might be 20 or 30 years older than me, they were interested in things that you don't learn when you're just building houses or apartments and everything. So it was a big learning curve for them. And for me, uh, it gave me confidence because at 22, you're going, why would anyone that's twice my age listen to a kid from California who's still living with his parents in the bedroom, you know, it's like. <laughs> and you also lived working with the original Imagineers, the, the, yes. and oh, the, yeah. the studio. So no, I, no I pressure was, there. I was pressed, uh, uh, apprentice under, well, I was the men. T of Claude Coates, who was my mentor, and Claude had designed this ride, and you probably know his work from going back to the beautiful paintings in the backgrounds of, um, of Pinocchio, all the way up through Lady in the Tram. And you were my mentor, so Claude is technically my grand yes. mentor. Yes, that's how I would refer to that, from now on. That is true. I, if I had hours, I'd tell you Claude's stories, but there's a book coming out this fall uh, by David Bossert and Alan Coates, and I wrote the foreword, and you must buy it on Imagineer and Claude Coates, so there's my marketing for the day. So here I was, in weather like it is. I, I wrote books too. Yeah, so, you're right. So we're and, I, I, and he wrote a foreword yes. for one of mine. So. And, and in the mountains book, I think. He's, he's got the whole thing. Um, but those are old. This is brand new. And, so, there you go. All right, and so I see this is when you were a guest fish. star on the Brady Bunch. I weighed, <laughs> I, think I, I weighed 110 pounds there. I wasn't carrying this. And uh, in the Florida sun, which we don't have humidity in California like you do here. And I'm, I'm always a, a long sleeve shirt, even when I was 22. Uh, so it was a, a real learning curve about the weather down here, especially in that summer of 71. But we, we got it there, and when I came back, there was nothing to do. It's like we're going out of business if this park doesn't do really well down here. So I started on a little project, which you probably all know, which is Big Thunder Mountain. And this is the site here at Walt Disney World, and originally there were two attractions. One was uh, the Western River Expedition that Mark Davis had done. And unfortunately, when there was an opening here with no Pirates of the Caribbean, which was Disneyland's greatest ride, they switched from doing uh, Mark's building that you can see there in the brown uh, to building a pirate ride. They felt that it was too close because yeah. Florida is so close to the Caribbean. Why would anyone want it? Yeah, that was why they didn't build it in the as, first place. As way. though the Caribbean was really overrun with pirates. But <laughs> everybody that came to the park, they said, oh, don't go to Walt Disney World because they don't have the pirate ride, and that's the best ride at Disneyland. So immediately they went with a pirate ride. So I continued on with Big Thunder, and uh, I got to build a bigger, more beautiful model. This is actually for Disneyland in California. And the irony is the model I just showed you was designed first, but then Disneyland said, we want that. You know, don't give it to Walt Disney World, we want it. So I had to redesign it and flip it, because at Disneyland it's backwards, because it's on the other side of the river. 
And to make a long story short, this is the ultimate Big Thunder, which is over in Paris. And so it's, it's now a mountain range that exists, I think, on every continent yeah. in the world. It's the, it's the only mountain on three different continents. Yeah. And, um, and you changed the look based on uh, the part that you were in, because you, yeah. you told me for the book. My book, by the way. Yeah. This is a quote from that book. <laughs> Amazon Marketplace. It's a little expensive, but you'll, you'll get yeah. along. Um, but the one in California was inspired by Bryce Canyon yeah. in Utah, I believe, because it was more fanciful. And it's right next to Fantasyland, so it looks like Maleficent's uh, domain or something if you're looking from But there. here, it looks more like Monument Valley, like right out of the John Wayne movie to, to correspond with the With the spectacular version. nature of Walt Disney World. It's a spectacular park, so we wanted it spectacular. And we kind of went with that in Paris, but we moved it out to where Tom Sawyer Island is in the middle. So it is the most fun Big Thunder, too, because you have to dive under the river and back to get to it. So if you haven't been there, you need to go. So uh, the next thing that happened after I got done with Big Thunder was a little project called Epcot. And this is one of our early uh, concepts for the Seas Pavilion. I wanted a lot more fantasy in it, and there was a tug of war between making it scientific or, or bringing the, the traditional Disney way of telling stories. And this was before Little Mermaid, so that's not uh, King uh, Triton. It's Neptune. It, it, it would today be uh, Triton, I'm sure. And uh, he welcomed you into his world, and I've always loved the Ten Commandments, so uh, Triton was a gigantic automatronic who parted the oceans, and everybody then walked through the water to board a ride and you ended up in a sea base. Now this part of it did go on to become part of the final concept, but when you look at the model, you can see the circular part there is what they built, as well as the restaurants and the exhibits. But that whole giant building out there that was this ride was kind of very Fantasia-like. And uh, maybe someday, another lifetime, I don't know. You keep looking at me like uh, I have any influence whatsoever. And so you got to go a long way underwater through that tube on your way to the dome. It, was, it would have been really good. So by cutting the fun out of it, that, that was how they... Well, I didn't say that. Uh, my universal partner here. Okay. But yes. That's where the line, what about science? But now now we've, got, we've got little Nemo in there, so there is fun. Uh, the next was moving uh, over to the land pavilion, and there we were going to do a biome idea where the certain areas of the world that were dry and hot would, in this pavilion, actually cool the air, and so it was an energy exchange that was in balance, so the ice-cold areas would be uh, providing the heat and everything for the dry areas. And it was a really interesting thing that we were working with, University of Arizona, and uh, they ultimately, when we didn't build this, we built the pavilion that you see today. And they did build this pavilion at the university in Arizona. It's called Biosphere 2. And it's still open as a tourist attraction. It doesn't quite look as pretty as this, but pretty amazing. But as they say, the third time is the charm. And uh, that, for me, was Journey into Imagination, where these two little guys kind of came to life. And you know, you never start out with what you know Figment and Dreamfinder to be. So, you know, Figment was this craggy little, you know, uh, alligator y kind of character, and Dreamfinder was not quite as lovable, lovable as uh, uh, Ron, Ron uh, made him to be, if you met Ron yesterday. So, and then we had a problem that Figment was green, the dragons are always green. But Kodak, if you remember, sponsored the ride, and Kodak was yellow and orange. And do you remember what film company was green? <laughs> yeah, Fujifilm. So they looked at that, and we were all so happy to show them this picture. And I remember they were like eyes of horror. And they go, nothing that ever re represents the Kodak company can be green. So of course, uh, this is what we all know and love that came out of that. And Ex Atencio, the great animator, was responsible for kind of honing in on a lovable and wonderful pet set of characters. Um, he went into sculpture at Imagineering, and uh, it was just a delightful character that just lent itself to posing, and, and uh, I think that's why he still exists today, even though the ride that's in there today no longer reflects the emotion and the heart that the original ride did. Uh, so it's a tribute to something is working in that, that figure. And someone was saying to me the other day that 
characters are what we remember. When you think of The Wizard of Oz, you think of Dorothy and the Tin Man and all that. The adventures are secondary because you connected so carefully with those characters. And I think Figment has the same longevity about it. It's also, it had to be a challenge for you guys to capture a concept as vast as imagination and make it accessible to people. That was the hard part. You all are gathering information right now and you're storing it either in your minds or you're recording it, heaven forbid, or in one way or another. And then you're gonna recombine it to make something new. And it's simple, it seems, but gather, store, recombine. That took us six months to figure that out, you know, and settle on it. And then the Sherman Brothers happened to write a delightful song that illustrated that. Um, we took you into all the worlds in which people traditionally create, from the arts to um, literature. That was before computers, that was an IBM Selectric volcano. Uh, <laughs> Now this one I like, uh, we, we actually uh, pre predicted, so this is, shows you about uh, future predictions here. Look who's in the front on this scene, created in 1981 for Epcot. Uh, we knew we were gonna have a Spider-Man. <laughs> so, and yet where is Spider-Man today? I don't know, yeah, somebody else. Yeah, give him back, come on. That's a great ride, by the way, if you haven't been on it. Then you went, you saw how literature combined words to tell stories, and then into the world of performing arts with Figment and Dreamfinder, and then because it was Kodak, we wanted to show that science, too, was about imagination. And all of these were so difficult to do because it wasn't like space and transportation and the concrete other pavilions. Imagination is abstract, so how do you show uh, the abstraction of science, and we created a room where Dreamfinder winded a dial and sped up the clock and slowed it down and zoomed into micro worlds and zoomed out to macro worlds, and uh, all to, again, Sherman Brothers lyrics. You know? And so it was very uh, digestible, but a very profound thought that through film, we see things that normal people could not possibly see because of manipulation of time and space. And the, the Sherman Brothers, uh, I think that was something that they talked about learning from Walt, and that's that's almost where the song Spoonful of Sugar comes yes, from. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. Helps the medicine go down. Yeah, it's literally we need a spoonful of sugar today for this uh, COVID thing. I'll tell you. <laughs> that was, the spoonful of sugar was for polio. That's what children got. And when Richard's son came home one day, he said they gave us a, a little sugar cube on the medicine, and we were vaccinated today. Anyway, back to today, uh, Figment ended the show celebrating the fact that we can all be imaginative. It's not a skill that's only for certain people, but everybody uh, does it. And we, we can dispatch people into the image works where they got to make their own creative things. And at the exit, this little invention kind of stole the show on opening day at Epcot. It gave, and we're talking about personalities like the Wizard of Oz, that water has a personality. And I can tell you that little girl isn't thinking about a faucet right there. She's wondering if she can catch it and what it's gonna do next. And all the things we think about living creatures uh, was transferred through this fountain that Mark, uh, I can't even think of his last name. Okay, Mark was his name, we came up with it. He's got wet enterprises now. Fuller, thank you very much. And, uh, it's an interactive show, folks. Can anyone tell me? Is, is Ron answer. in the well, uh, room? No. Is that you? Yep. Hooray. Okay. Okay. And I look the same, right? <laughs> so you've gone from Greg Brady to Mike Brady. As the, yeah. As the and Pat. <laughs> a little bit Pat. And what's great is because of the character being a very... Uh, I think emotionally engaging. Marvel came to us and said, we want to do a series of comics. I don't know if they're still for sale in, in Epcot, but uh, they're a beautiful series. This would make the greatest movie, uh, the Figment movie would be an awesome thing and, and with Dreamfinder back in the saddle, that would be, uh, I just, I think the company should do that. That would give us the impetus to put the ride back in the Epcot. So, I told you that I was apprenticed to Claude Clothes. I was his mentee. And while I was in that stage of my career, I painted this with his help and direction because he had done Pinocchio. And I never painted anything that elaborate again, but it hung over my desk. 
And it ended up when they needed to redo Disneyland's Fantasyland, they said, well, what about that kid in the model shop? Maybe he could do it. He did that painting and it looks really good. So I got the job. So always advertise your values, put it above your desk. It works. And I, I could tell other stories about that, that other people succeeded like Harper Goff by marketing the World Showcase above his desk. And the president of the company came in and said, Harper, what's that? And he said, let me tell you about it. The next thing is what you see down there in Epcot today. Anyway, so we built a brand new fantasy land at Disneyland and it's really charming. And if you've been to Paris, we've copied it pretty much over there. Because originally fantasy land had, the, had a look similar to what the Magic Kingdom has here with the medieval... It's called fantasy. economy fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's Actually, retired, he can say these things. Well, I mean, it, the one here has grown and it's a lot more elaborate now than it was on opening day. So, you know, we were at a point in time when Disney movies weren't really clicking with the audiences the way that E.T. And, St and Star Wars were. I saw Condor Man three times you in the did, theater. Okay. I did what I could. I did. And I saw The Fox and the Hounds 20 times. So. <laughs> anyway, it's not a competition. Uh, but the facts were that the new Walt Disney, with, with two of them, was Stephen and George. And Stephen works for you. So uh, we had to go with Things are getting a little testy up here on the and so, <laughs> stage. Uh, Anyway, we... I, I, I mean, Star Tours too. You did, you were there, but other one, yeah. <laughs> later. We so, we went up to Ron Miller's uh, winery, and George drew, drove up in a BMW. He said, I think my movies are first class, and I think Disney at, uh, theme parks are first class, so I really want to do this with you guys. And so that, of course, led us to several things. When Michael Eisner found out it would take four, three years to do Star Tours, he said, I want something there this summer. So George, let's partner with the number one pop star today and get a film in this summer. And of course, you all know what that was. So uh, that was a big change. And we had to really start rethinking, you know, a modern, kind of a modern Disney. And of course, that meant bringing the Star Speeder 3000 to Disneyland and Walt Disney World. Well, you always tell that great story about how exciting it was when Michael and Frank came in and that first Saturday when oh, yeah. Michael came to WDI and, and you guys son. walked him through some of the things you had cooking and that kind of started. Well, John, Renaissance. Michael didn't really go to theme parks and he was very honest about it. He said, I know everything about movies and TV. I just found out he greenlit the Star Trek motion picture. He said, we're not going to do another series. We need to make this big. We need to make it a motion picture. So that was that was a new Michael Eisner story. But yeah, he said, I don't know this stuff yet. But so I brought my 14-year-old Breck, and he's gonna see whether or not he thinks this ride would be good. And I'm going, oh great, my career 14-year-old kid. <laughs> and uh, then I thought, no, that's even better than executives. I can now tell it joyfully about how fun it's going to be. And I finished. And he goes, Dad, that is so great. We've got to build it. And then. Michael says, okay, fine, we're doing that, what else? And then the next was Splash Mountain. So anyway, this was a breakthrough at the time. Nobody, none of the people other than the fighter pilots or airline pilots had ever been in a simulator. So as you all know, it's still running today. And some people would say they like this one better than uh, what it, I can't even think of it. Uh, uh, I, I have nothing to say. I don't know. Uh, I wanted <laughs> Galaxy Smugglers. Smugglers run. So we can do a raise hands thing, but I still like stuff. Uh, this was what happened when we opened it at Disneyland. The line was five hours long, and uh, they had an emergency meeting, and I remember that uh, it was decided to leave the park open for three days without closing Disneyland. And so you could come at two in the morning or four in the morning, and. It was the biggest party ever, and people that had waited the five hours for a five-minute ride were coming off saying, let's get in line again, because they knew they had three days of, uh, to do it, so it was a terrific thing. The counterpoint to that was doing a ride that was basically an outsider's property was not really you know, in the Disney uh, culture at that time, so we had to really quick prepare a traditional Disney ride. And we used up all the material that was really appropriate for doing rides, except for Splash Mountain, based on the, the, the stories of the, the Song of the South. And it had Academy Award winning music, Zippity Duda, and whatnot. So it seemed a natural plus. We had a show that was on its last legs. This was 1989 when we opened, but 
America Sings had been made for the bicentennial in 76, and we didn't want to throw those characters out, so we found that they were all designed by Mark Davis, and Mark Davis had done all the model sheets for Song of the South, and so it was a perfect thing. They all looked like they were one and the same, so they migrated across Disneyland. They packed up their bags and moved to Critter Country. And, and Michael saw this on that same Saturday. He did. Yeah. It was right after that, and I thought... So he went on a shopping spree. He did, and, and I then... thought the boy, uh, uh, Breck, would not like uh, little characters and all that. And when I finished telling Splash Mountain, he said, that's even better than Star Tours, you know? <laughs> and so so I, I came into that meeting going, do we still have jobs? And I left it with, and we got I got this Captain EO thing, we got to get Michael in here, and, and he, he picked what story he wanted to tell. We gave him like four And Captain stories. EO came about because they want, that, that would be a much quicker turnaround yeah. you know, than an attraction that would take years to build. Absolutely. Think, Michael think. said, I know how to do movies, so you can't tell me it takes three years to make a movie. <laughs> so, yeah. And so I sold this to Breck by saying it's got the longest, highest, steepest ever waterfall in the world on a flume ride. And, uh, and that helped for his age group demographic. And of course we had the mix of Disney show with the fear factor of uh, a thrill ride. And so it's been an odd kind of mix, but it's, I think it's tempted people to do something that's outside their comfort zone. And then when they survive, they're really happy they did it, you know, so. And you said uh, that that was a happy accident in that Dick Nunes and the, the operating side of the parks were looking for a flume ride, and oh, you didn't want to necessarily... He wouldn't shut up about that. It was like, so have I got my flume ride yet? And, it, and you know, we have Knott's Berry Farm, and they have a really good flume ride at Knott's. It's still really good. And uh, they just went in and put a whole lot of new audiometronics in it. And I thought, well, this will seem like we're copying, but doing a Splash Mountain thing with cartoons rather than uh, loggers uh, that they have in theirs. It, it was enough different that I was comfortable with it. And it, we had a problem that nobody was going to Critter Country. We only had uh, Country Bear Jamboree. And it needed a big counterpoint ride to, because the other side of the park had uh, um, the Matterhorn and the Space Mountain. And we uh, had Big Thunder, but this would balance it out. And Country Bears was never as popular no. in Anaheim as it was here. For some reason, running. country music in the South is a bigger thing. Like you have <laughs> Tennessee and all of that, or Dolly Parton. In other news, water is wet. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's not in California. And so they built two theaters. We had two, and you only have one. And they were empty, you know, so yeah. Anyway, the Splash did help that. And didn't you, uh, didn't the idea originate, you told me you were sitting in your car on the freeway and it just... As I did every single day, and it was my two hour, before cell phones, you had two hours where nobody could interrupt you, and so you'd sit there and you'd go, the America Sings figures, we need something in Critter Country, and we have the zippity doo -dah characters from the movie. Okay, so I got into work and I said, I, I think we've got it. We've got an idea here, you know, it's gonna work. It works in the South, it works in that area of the park, and um, it can use all the characters we already have, and it's not like Knott's log ride. So, anyway, here I am on the empty soil outside of Paris, and uh, I think of all the times in my career I felt really, even though there's a, so much scary stuff from turning that ground into a theme park, um, I felt confident because we had good management at that time and uh, they were supporting it. They wanted it to be the most beautiful park we've ever done. That was their statement. Make it more beautiful than anything because it's going to be the one that we have our legacies on as leaders of Disney. And so we felt like we're going to do this and everybody with me on that. We had five plans. You heard Tom, as Tom Morris is speaking right now, Tom upstairs or wherever the other one. They're a little upset that yeah. Tony it's stole their at the their same arm. time, so. Uh, but Tom did the Fantasyland area. And all of us were schooled under the original Imagineers. And we all knew the, not just the rules, but what made us excited as children. And so that's what is in the Disneyland Paris project. And for me, the idea of living at Disneyland was a dream. And, you know, and Walt said that in Epcot, he said, on, a, on that film, he said, you will live a life you couldn't find anywhere else on Earth. And my dream of a life I couldn't find anywhere else would be to live in the theme park. So we proposed this audacious idea of building a theme park right at the entrance. 
And Michael Eisner uh, agreed with it and said, but where are you going to get the money? He said, you're going to have to kill one of the other hotels. And so I went on a shooting spree and we took out the Venturi concept. Sorry, Mr. Venturi. Uh, and we put the money into uh, building the Disneyland Hotel. Because at that time, this had never been done. Never done. And there were a lot of people in management that said, this will not fly. It is, uh, nobody would want to hear the parades rehearsing at night or noises in the park. And I said, you'd rather hear the fire engines in the city of Paris at night, you know? I said, and as it's turned out, and, oh, and then they were going to hang your underwear on the balconies that you'd see on Main Street. And none of that has happened, you know? It's, and now we have them in California and Tokyo, and it's a thing now. The other thing was you got to cover Main Street like we did in Tokyo because they shop. Nobody in Paris shops, but they love being out in the sun. So uh, we knew we had to keep Main Street open like it, here, it is here in Florida. But you but still had the weather issue. We still had the weather issue, so we had to go. And behind the streets of Main Street are these beautiful arcades. But you can see where the people are. This was shot at the same time. They're all out in the limited sun they get. They want it. And so these, when it's snowing, you can bet these are full but they don't destroy the, the beauty of Main Street. Uh, and because we have five languages over there that are commonly spoken, we had to be visual. So you can't put a sign, the Haunted Mansion, that doesn't even translate. So it's, uh, that would have been Maison du Haunt. And so it's Phantom Manor, which looks the same. And, but mainly what we did is went to designs that were visually um, descriptive, so you look at that and you know that is a haunted house. That's, a, that's an instance of the outside reflecting the inside, because even when I was doing research for the book, I found out that back in the, it, from 69 into the 70s, Disneyland would get complaints from parents because mm -hmm. the Haunted Mansion is this pristine plantation house, and they thought it was okay to take their kids in, and the kids got scared. That's right. But you look at that house, and you're like, There's oh, no way, yeah. yeah. And, it's like, and they've written their own stories. It's, it's wonderful to read all the French interpretations of the bride and who everybody is in the story. And I think that's great because you are the star of these rides. We sometimes try to write too strong of a backstory that you don't have any place in. And I think a really good ride is where you see yourself in that as the key important uh, person. Now here again, for Pirates of the Caribbean, in both our parks and estates, it's a sign that says Pirates of the Caribbean. But in Paris, you find all the symbols of pirate dumb right at the entrance to the pirate ride. Now, an opposite thing we had was that, while we, you know, we have this language problem, we also have a place that's known for castles. And if you look at the crenellations and turrets there, you'll recognize forms that are on the castle here in Walt Disney World. So we had to invent a new look. And Frank Armitage, who painted with Ivan Earl on the movie Sleeping Beauty, was working at Imagineering at this time in the 90s. And uh, I said, Frank, could you do a, a fake Ivan Earl here, please? You know, so Frank painted this, which became the opening day ticket and all the marketing art we had. And I, I've got a, a nice uh, view here from the back of the castle uh, because I think Tom Morris was heavily involved in the design of this. And he made a point of literally rotating the model day in and day out to make sure that every single angle as you walk around is spectacular. And you said you had to go fanciful because in France, they, if you had built Cinderella Castle like it exists at Disney World, they have that. Yeah. In every well, couple and, of neighborhoods, there's a... And even if you walk through castle. the cathedrals, you're, you'd be competing because the Gothic uh, architecture and things that we use here, pr primarily in, in California a little bit, is what you find everywhere. So uh, it had to complement rather than uh, compete with what was in the neighborhood. So how do you complement? You do that by building uh, stained glass windows inside that were done by a guy that was commissioned by the Queen of England to do all the restoration in Windsor and in uh, you know Westminster and all of that. And I said, well, why did you come out of retirement to do this? And he goes, have you ever looked at Gothic windows? They put panic into people. People are in agony and looking down and all that. He said, I want to have something that people will look at for hundreds of years that makes them smile. And so that was really a neat thing. And those windows are gorgeous. But remember in my first slide and the thing I did when I was in school, I got my dragon in the basement of that castle. <laughs> so, never give up on an idea. 
And meanwhile, the chairman of Kodak is like, I feel a great disturbance. Disturbance of old boys. Well, they didn't sponsor it, but this time, but he used Baxter, to my old friend. You know, actually, it's an homage to a great uh, contemporary of Walt Disney, Ray Harryhausen. Did anyone grow up with those films? Uh, this is the dragon from the seventh voyage of Sinbad, primarily. But by now, when we were building this, there were very few people left in management that knew who did what or whatever. So if you look carefully, he's got the chain around him that uh, pulled him tight so Sinbad could get through the dragon's lair and into the magician's castle. Anyway, it's a beautiful set. The dragon comes to life and scares the Jesus out of the kids that are walking through this, and it's all underneath the castle. And this is the type of thing that I feel in the industry you don't see as much no. today, because uh, if you look at it from a financial perspective, it's like, well, what's the return on this elaborate Yeah, how many dragon people for an hour are going to view it? And I said, it's just something that's wonderful that when you go home and then the bottom of the, you know. And, and that's one of the things you'll talk yeah, about yeah, 20 forever. years later. It turned out to be the number three talked about thing when we opened the park. And it wasn't even, they said, we're not counting it as attendance because we don't know how to measure it. But when they just reviewed what people thought about their day, it was, it was number three. Things like that and things like Snow White Grotto at Disneyland, the, the, these little quiet, almost ancillary experiences yeah. that really help you create memories in addition to the blockbuster attractions. I'm going to see where we're supposed to be. Where are we supposed to be? Um, Splash. They're, they're we're done with Splash, so we're in good. We, we can leave. We're, in we're done. Okay. All right. Um, so. You know, our Space Mountain, reinvented Space Mountain. So uh, if you know and love either California or here, we decided, because it's shaped like this and you have to get to the top while you're still inside the mountain, let's put the launch on the outside so you can go all the way up above the mountain and then dive in. So uh, how are we gonna do that? Well, we invented the, the catapult launch on an angle there to get us up. And then we said, that's not good enough. We want to write a score that you'll accompany this ride. And the poor guy that wrote the music had to write it like 90 times with a little keyboard where he captured like what kind of emotions he was gonna do. Now, that's, that would be kind of okay here and in California, but this one has um, three loops inside. So, you know, he had to go da 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 you know, like in through this thing. Unfortunately, I think they've changed the, the show in there. So the new one is kind of more random, but the original score, was written exactly to every single... And the story and the look also reflected yeah. Jules Verne, Jules whose Verne. work was a major influence on Discovery Land. And right? it was Definitely. also, you know, you bring up a good point, because uh, in part of our contract, one whole land in Paris had to be um, related to French culture or European culture, and so we picked all the great visionaries uh, from Leonardo da Vinci on forward uh, that influenced the world. I mean, the only reason we're in space is because of these visionaries, and in fact, Jules Verne launched From Earth to the Moon, his book, is in Central Florida. That's where he, de he depicted that the first attempt to go to the moon would be from Central Florida. Imagine that. And that was in the 1880s, you know. So, yes, we had the first loops, we had the first onboard audio, and we, the first loops in a Disney ride. And then we, um, we also had the catapult launch and so forth. That, so that was pretty cool. And then just to gild the lily, sitting out in front is the Nautilus from 20,000 Leagues with the exploding cannon in the back there. With a, you can see the vehicle on the outside of the mountain shooting up the side as the steam comes out, launching you above the mountain. And then you can tour the Nautilus. And we have a giant squid in there and everything. It's pretty cool. Now, we came back to California, and for those of you that are Florida-centric, you know the dinosaur ride over in Animal Kingdom. Uh, that ride system was borrowed from the original that we built. So you've worked on some of the more obscure Disney attractions. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to give them a little attention. We try to explain that all the turns and things that we created for Indy aren't necessarily set up to see dinosaurs along, but there was some real uh, people that thought they, that we could save a lot of money by using the exact same track. But it was funny because when we opened um, the dinosaur, Michael came off and he said, where's the rolling ball at the end of this? And they said, what do you mean? That's, that's the indie ride. And he said, no, no, no. I mean, where that is, as you go down at the end, there's nothing there. And so within a week, I think they put the T-Rex head in there. Uh, I know people was working night and day to put a version of a rolling ball, in this case a T-Rex here, a rolling ball in California. 
Yeah. And after Star Tours, this, this sort of cemented the relationship with, with Lucas. Lucas. Yeah. It's now hit both of his major and, 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 and the Disney Park. You're right, because we couldn't have done this either because it's uh, based on a motion base, like in Star Tours, but it's on a, a truck. So we literally bought a, a little Doran simulator, you know, that you saw in the malls back in those days. And we put it on the back of a flatbed, and we had a computer driving the flatbed, and trailing it was a little box that had the computer in it to see whether or not we could actually believe all the bumps and things that were happening were really happening. And of course, it, it worked really well. Well, this was one of the attractions, I think, that when I got the, had the privilege of working with you, this, this is what sort of guided my own thinking about themed entertainment, because you would talk at length about how when indie came up, the, the big question was, all right, what would the audience want and expect to see in anything that bore the name Indiana Jones? Yeah. And you said, okay, so we gotta have the hat, we gotta have the whip, we gotta have snakes, we gotta have a rolling boulder, we gotta have bugs. And, and it's like that really fed into what- It did, we, we have a great video, I don't have the time to show it, of uh, interviewing guests at Disneyland about that, what would they expect to see? And we got all the ones, we ticked off all the ones you just said, but then one couple came up and they said, we expect to see enslaved children. Yes, that would make <laughs> us. <laughs> and I said, you know, sometimes we can't give everybody their wishes. So, so Temple of Doom was the go-to indie movie for yeah. that couple. Yeah. So the other thing that you have a danger of is you get a great artist like Ryan Jowers who painted this, and then we've got to live up to it. You know, like when you send that out to the audience and they're expecting to find that. It's always a challenge whether you can pull it off, and I think we came darn close to Brian's rendering and what we did. So. And we had an opening half hour special, and uh, guess who were the stars of it? Not me, but I had a tiny small part, and I got to meet two of my heroes from that film, you know, so like, I'll never forget that, you know? <laughs> that was, I remember John told me, he said, because I, I was always giving him the signal that I already knew what he was going to say because I'd written the script. And he said, the art of acting, young man, is you don't know what I'm going to say until after I've said it. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed, you know, but I will never be an actor, I guess. So we have a problem within uh, a Disney company that it has to reflect the audience that's coming to our parks you know, the, 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 today. And I had grown up with Swiss Family Robinson, which came out in 1960, and I love the treehouse music. I can, all of us that grew up with that, and it's still here at Disney World. But in California... You were a greeter in front of the Jungle Cruise. Da, 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 and uh, Bonnie Arnold was the producer, and she worked right with us. And Michael said, if you can get it there the day that the movie comes out in theaters, you've got a job. And uh, it was done on a dime on a dollar for just a rehab budget. But it generated enough revenue because the ride can handle about 900 an hour of walking through the tree. And we were down to 200 an hour. And immediately when we reopened with this, it went up to 900 an hour. And then they said to me that we could have spent twice as much money if we'd known it was gonna be that successful. <laughs> well, and that's also a great example of, of what Walt had always said Disneyland would be. It's a yeah, living organism living. that can change and evolve over time. Because a lot of times when uh, when something has changed in the park, uh, there, there's often an outcry, sometimes justified. Every sometimes. time there is. Every time. The every best time. you can get is having to be nice. <laughs> After the outcry, the best you get is, well, it's really not as bad as I thought it was going to be. But, but what I've always found interesting is people are like, well, Walt never would have stood for this. I'm like, yeah. Walt would have been the first person to take yeah. something out if it wasn't working or if it were under we, we, I think we're all guilty of loving our childhood and not wanting to see any of it go away because it just reminds us of getting older. So, Absolutely. sometimes, and my only, my only guidance on this is what comes back has to be better. And sometimes we don't always do that, you know, and that's the danger. Now today, I was talking backstage, there's no way we bring an elephant and have it rear up on its hind legs with Tarzan on it. I thought with, it was fake. We no, and the guests are like, those are guests right there, you know? <laughs> uh, 
but it was a wonderful. Because I can see the head of the communications department just <laughs> fainting dead. I know. Out of an elephant rearing back. And Disneyland is crowded. It's not like here where you have space. You know, it's very narrow. And uh, and so that was opening day, and it, it was we we beat the movie by one day, and the directors and producers and everybody were there with their cameras. Everywhere. They were so excited. Uh, to have something the day their film came out actually at Disneyland. And that's unprecedented because normally m management likes to, to make sure that something is, is successful, especially yes, now yeah. we, we live in such an IP-driven mm -hmm. world that you, you want that proven commodity, mm -hmm. so it's pretty daring to have something the day and date. I think that's the good, I mean, when you think of Walt Disney making the Disneyland castle, Sleeping Beauty's castle, in 1955 when it had just started in production and would not enter theaters till 1959 four years later let's call the centerpiece of my disneyland sleeping beauty castle i mean that is really scary stuff you know well even uh when i had my college program here in 89 uh and then came back the following summer i, I happened to run into dick nunes in the park and i asked about a little mermaid attraction yeah because that had taken the world by storm and was a huge box office hit and i will never forget what he said he goes she has to earn it yeah and it, it was like i it was such a weird response but i've reflected on that for 30 years since then because the, it really means something you know in order to be enshrined in one of these parts it does you and do want to earn when you realize that was in production when we opened splash mountain but there was no willingness to risk on it those guys had been moved to trailers to make that movie and they had to cross the street and use the imagineering cafeteria and if that movie had not been the home run they would have been gone and now she has half a fantasy life. yeah and she was here with you yesterday i believe all right, so not every time we do something does it go. This is Westcott, which was uh, taking and reimagining Epcot for Anaheim. Uh, and I thought it would have been great. Uh, we had all the future world inside one giant building there. You can see off to the uh, left side. Of, I guess it would be the left side for you. Um, and then the corners of the world. So we had four corners of the world relating generally to Asia, Africa, uh, Americas, and Europe. And so we combined, you know, groupings into those areas. But the big uh, surprise for it was that they were all hotels that not only had the rides and, and restaurants that we know, but uh, you could stay and live in four uniquely different themed experiences. Um, but then, you know, the powers that be changed and we now have California Adventure. And so uh, <laughs> now uh, I, it was never it's this really awesome good before. now. I don't, I don't know. You know, they've added so much stuff to it that it's pretty good now. But, you know, on opening day, it was kind of thin. But, you know, it, I don't work here with the hoe. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I like California Adventure. The Cars ride is incredible. The, the Ga Guardians is a, I, I think the tower here is the best tower in the world. Uh, second rate, but now that it's Guardians, it's, it's, it's only, it's unique, and it's a good show with a little raccoon rocket. It's really a good show. And so it gets back to what you said about yeah. the characters. Yeah. It, it works because you love those characters so much, and you'll mm -hmm. go on any mm -hmm. journey. Yeah, and so it's just a learning curve. I would have loved to have done what we did, and I was very passionate about it. Uh, but, you know, it's come around, and now it's doing really, really well and they just opened Marvel's campus there. And so, anyway, another one. Uh, we tried to redo Fantasyland on a dime on a, or excuse me, Tomorrowland, uh, the dime on a dollar, and paint. You know, let's go away from white paint and make it turquoise paint and gold paint and all of that. And uh, I think the lesson learned was people can see that I think guests would react better to one really great attraction than trying to skimp and put it all over the whole thing. And we originally were gonna have a home run uh, called Rocket Rods that was basically the same thing as Test Track, only it was a vehicle in this, the phase of uh, design. And at the end of the ride, after you'd ridden it, you got to go to the design center and flush it out and pick the colors and the shapes and everything and then print your, uh, your, your uh, faces into that vehicle that you designed. 
and i think it would have been a great idea but again there was no money to do it the right way i got on it once you did yeah amazing right i mean it's like the thing that goes back like really love bug and you take off like i was scared to death i mean i don't know what the issue was but it was fun well the issue was it was built on the people mover track which is dead uh still and when you go around a corner, we had to slow it down in order to go around a corner. So you had this, you know, it was, it was, it was an on to the next. But sometimes there's magic. And uh, Michael used to host uh, charrettes, we called them, where you'd go to a very special place like Aspen, Colorado, where this was. And he said, let's come up with things about the sky or things about the land and things about the ocean and see what you can come up with. And my group was the sky, and you can see it up there on the top there, and it says the sky. And I thought, well, what if we put you on a hang glider, on you know rows of hang gliders, and, and sent them out into, uh, instead of an IMAX movie that's usually up above you, we put it kind of like out and below you, and then flew the hang gliders out, and we could pillow them up and down. So, you know, this was like a 20 minute exercise. and. Uh, and we came back and no one said, well, that, that maybe has some uh, possibilities. Maybe we should get the engineers to look at that. So a fellow by the name of Mark Sumner still had his erector set at his mother's house. And he called her and said, Mom, do you know where the erector set is? And she knew where it was in the garage. So they got it out and Mark built this little machine that showed how these rows of uh, hang gliders could move up into that dome uh, every five minutes. And of course, I think you all know what this became. It became soaring. And that's now one of our most popular things in all the parks. I think we have one. Not, not Paris, but everywhere else. And, and again, it comes from a napkin sketch. A napkin and, sketch. And a guy playing with it. And, and see, when people say, oh, how do you do all this stuff? I couldn't have done what Mark did. I just thought, wouldn't it be cool to be in that thing? And you saw that little just thing. But it was the kind of inspiration that Mark goes, I know how I can figure that out. And I'll get my erector, erector set and turn all the little wheels and stuff and, and there we'll have it. So, another crisis for me was when I became a ride operator, one of my favorite rides to work was the subs at Disneyland. And the evil people of 1990s took it out and they took the one out here. And I remember I said to them on the decommissioning day, they had the, the, the Navy there and they were selling submarine sandwiches and they were going, isn't this fun? I said, no, it's the worst day of my life at Disney. <laughs> and I said to them, I said, you're going to live to see the day when it comes back. And it took me almost 10 years. Uh, and we went through movies like Atlantis, The Lost Continent, and everything we thought we could build up a ride around that mythology and then finally it hit when uh, Pixar did Finding Nemo and it was the highest grossing animated film of ever you know and uh, they were very eager to bring it into Disneyland and it came this close to being a warehouse for merchandising you know but it's now up and running and you amazing things where you work with these characters that are animated underwater uh, and you're in a real water environment, so it's a really tricky uh, device. And, and some, some of the you know fun from that that's very exciting at the end. It's not just the, the fun part, but the um, thrills too. Uh, so we kept some of the original and uh, going into a real water environment, but then bringing in the new characters. But you had said something once in, in a meeting that, that has all, always stayed with me as well. And you were talking about the submarine ride, and the same would have applied to 20,000 Leagues here too. But you said, this is part of the DNA of the yes. Disneyland experience, yes. taking guests literally underwater and out into the cosmos with Space Mountain. Yes. You, you talked about all of these. The diversity of Disneyland, if you pin a pin out of the farthest spaces, for me, that would be Dumbo, uh, the submarines, and Lincoln or the Hall of Presidents. That you can go to one place and experience that range of entertainment is why it's special. If you honed it all in so that things were more or less the same, uh, it wouldn't be the draw that it is to come and have such extraordinary experiences. When I watch kids walking down the stairway into this ride, and they're very aware that's water, and that it's right there, and as they go down each step, it's It's above, real water, yeah. and you're really underwater, and that's part of your day at this yeah. point, part of yeah. what makes it what it is. So, we're coming now to Lincoln, since I brought him up. 
And he was always something very important to me because I got my job at Disneyland the year this opened and it was sort of the catalyst at 17 that I said, that is truly amazing and I'm going to work there. Uh, we had the opportunity about 10 years ago to reinvent it uh, and it, you, it was the first installation of the technology that you know is in the Navi, uh, in the boat ride over in the Animal Kingdom. Uh, and what we did here is I found this piece, which Herbie Ryman had painted and they never used. So I, I had no money, but I thought maybe we can create a show that feels different. And we put music from all of our patriotic shows, including America the Beautiful, All the Presidents, American Adventure, Lincoln, The World's Fair. Uh, they all have little homages in this show. And Marty Scalar, who uh, was my leader at Imagineering, said, I think that's the best version of Lincoln we've ever done. But uh, people wonder like, well, what do I do? Do I draw or anything? I can, but this is the kind of thing I would do. We had enough money to do one painting to tell about the Gettysburg Address. And so I did this chicken scratch again on, on a little tablet about where the camera would start and that it had to have a sign that said Gettysburg because the narrator doesn't, doesn't say it. And uh, so I gave this to a, a brilliant artist who turned it into this rough sketch and then it became part of uh, a key part of the story and expressing what was important about Lincoln. But the real change was this. Uh, this was the first character that has a skeleton that is sculpted on Lincoln's features. And that allows when we put the skin on for that, uh, to literally leap to the magnets that are embedded in the skin so it aligns perfectly. A lot of people, you know, I remember the great movie ride, you'd say, well, that doesn't look like Gene Kelly or whatever, and that's because the skin didn't perfectly match the skeleton. And uh, so that was solved first here with Lincoln. And I've got a little test that's kind of interesting. It has some audio here. And in that faith. Yeah. Now this is what's in the rod. Let us to the end. Dare to do our duty as we understand it. Now, a president can't be very expressive, but what we did after we shot that, I'm gonna show you something nobody's seen. This shows you what we could do if this guy was a comedian, you know? We could have him do all these things. Unfortunately, you can't do that with a president. Maybe you could do it, you know, in recent times, but... <laughs> so if you've, ever, if you've ever wondered what Lincoln would look like if he said, Zoinks! Yeah, <laughs> now you know. And now for the other side. So my last project was one that Claude Coates uh, did for me and that I mentored under him. And I found a young fellow in Holland, Michael Dendulk, who you may know for his first accomplishment down here, which was the uh, Frozen attraction down in uh, the Norway Pavilion. Uh, but when we tried Michael out, he'd come from a park, Efteling in Holland, which if you haven't been there, it's Disney quality. It's really an amazing park and uh, we lured him away and I worked with him. We, and this is one of Michelle's uh, uh, sketches. And uh, you know, he, I shouldn't even call it a sketch. He's a master artist and he understands architecture. And he's got that European quality that uh, you just don't find that in America uh, very easily anyway. So this was what he did. And I worked right with him on this as we took it into a model here. Uh, for Disneyland. This is a small project. It was a test uh, how he could adapt to California, America, all of that, and Disney uh, coming from a theme park world in Europe. And uh, it was a tremendous success. This was opening day at Disneyland. And the interesting thing about this property, uh, when you're there, if you see that tower that's sort of clipped off on the left side, uh, up at the top of that in that gold circle, it says CPG. Carnation Plaza Garden, so that's kind of a hidden uh, Mickey for me. And that's where I got my first job at Disneyland, was on this property. And they had taken that restaurant out, and nobody went here. It's right next to the castle at Disneyland. Nobody there. It's where the bands would play. Yeah, yeah. and you might, get, you might get a band at night, but there was nothing to eat there. There was nothing to do, so it become a dead corner of Disneyland. Once we opened this, we still have the bands at night, but it, it's so great to go in there and see this precious space right next to the Sleeping Beauty's castle, filled with people and the, and the little kids are meeting the princesses inside. And it's really a, del a delightful little new addition to Disneyland. So that was kind of my handing off the baton, if you will, to uh, my, uh, my new mentee who I yell at him all the time. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't like what he's doing. No, he's a really good, he's really good. Uh, 
the guy, and I think you'll see a lot of his projects coming to life in the future. So they gave me this thing called the Disney Legend Award. Uh, and we had Dreamfinder and Figment there with us again on this, this day. Not me. Not you, I know, but it was still, I didn't say anything, and they somehow picked the right characters to bring out. And, uh, so I was thrilled with that. And, but even better for me was um, getting a window on Main Street at Disneyland. Um, and another plug, they, nobody told me this, but they sell a pin here at Walt Disney World for the window in Disneyland in California. So I've now called all my friends saying, can you get me one of those, can you get me one? I think I have 12 of them or something now that people have sent me, but I, did, I didn't, nobody even said they were making it or selling it, but anyway, having a window on Main Street, I was the first one that was of the second generation, so everybody out in that window is Walt Disney's relatives, his parents, all of the Imagineers that, you know, founded, dug the ground at Disneyland, and uh, they had all been given their recognition, and so I think I'm like the first of the kids that grew up at Disneyland when they were little, who came there and, uh, experienced it and I think that's guided me in my whole career because I remember how wonderful it was to go to Disneyland and what things you have to do to make it great and, and memorable and most importantly that each thing we do you want to go on over and over and over again because you wonder why am I standing in line for Peter Pan for 40 minutes and I've seen it like 15 times it is the most aspirational thing you could ever do to fly out of a child's bedroom window out of her London in a pirate galleon on your way to the stars. That was from Ray Bradbury, by the way. So thank you very much. That brings me to No, I was, I was just going to say that, like, I've actually used that explanation when people ask, well, in relation to all of the other di dark rides, why does Peter Pan always have this, this crazy weight? And it's for that reason, mm -hmm. and people can't always articulate why, but it's an incredibly unique experience. Aspiration. And, and aspirational, which is really one of the guiding principles of, of themed entertainment. Uh, we, we do have permission to, to go a little over, so I... We do. Yeah. Okay. I thought we went over. No, that was 45. What time is it? Are you good? Is it a, okay, does that mean Q&A or what? Well, no, all I was going to say was like, you know, here we are uh, within days of Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary, and we yeah. saw that, that photo of you installing 20,000. Yes, 50 years, 50 plus years now. Yeah, and that was probably in July. Yeah. And, and you said, you know, you're second generation, you sat at the feet of the masters, and, um, you, you know, I, I've been privileged to, to count you as a mentor and, and learn from you. So as, as we stand here uh, facing the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World, you know, what do you see for the, the future of themed entertainment? Well, what would you like to see? Oh, are you kidding? I want that Mary Poppins ride immediately. <laughs> fascination right now with VR headsets and stuff, but I think that's going to be a home thing. I think you're going to see movies, this is my prediction, that you go to in the regular theater format, and then when you buy it, either a download or whatever, you're going to put on a headset, and you're going to be able to watch the movie if that's all you want to do. But suppose you want to go somewhere else in that movie that they didn't do in the film, and you can now, instead of going in the tunnel of Indiana Jones, you can go down this trail over here and make your own movie. I think that's where that goes. So when I see things on board a ride vehicle, there's nothing better than being in a, in a themed environment that's immersive where you're actually in a space. And that's why you fight the parking and everything to get into a, a magical place like even Universal or Disney, where you know for a little while you're in worlds that don't exist in the real world and they're tactfully there. So the Jungle Cruise for me as a place is the best virtual reality. So I think we'll see that go to the, you know, some extension of between video games and movies. I think that's where the merge will be. But for this, I think continuing to find new ways to take you into real spaces that are really existing there, that are not like the world we live in, is why 
people come from all over the world to do this. So that's what we've got to find are all these new amazing things that we are wrapping up right now. We, no, I just want to wrap up uh, by saying, obviously, in the course of the presentation, you've seen what Tony's legacy is uh, in terms of the attractions and the experiences and the memories. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be in California when we had your re retirement lunch uh, some years back. And uh, I said something then that I would just like to repeat here. Y you guys are just so incredibly lucky to, to be in the room with this man and to hear these stories. But beyond the legacy of attractions, Tony has also left a legacy of people. And I, th I think I'm finding as I get older and start to pass the baton yeah. to myself, it's like that nothing could be more critical for some of these principles of themed entertainment and storytelling to, to live on. And, and I'm proud to count myself as part of that legacy. And I know countless other people are as well. And uh, you know, we, we hope that that's gonna live on because that's what's going to allow all of us to continue to create these magical places and experiences for all of us to come together. And if we've learned nothing in the past, year and a half is that we desperately want and need to do that yep. uh, and that's hopefully what the future holds is a return to that so on behalf of a and grateful nation thank right you and if they want to redesign the imagination pavilion pick them i'm ready to go address your letters to bob shape at 500 south point of business street burbank california 9151 ladies and gentlemen tony back